Shalom. And welcome back, everybody. I'm Levi Chazan. I'm coming to you from Yerushalayim, the holy city, the capital of Israel. We're here on uh, Sefer Yoshua, chapter 6. Thanks for being with us. First of all, let's have a little <clears throat> recap of what's been going on up until this period of time. The book starts off with the death of Moshe, handing over the torch to Yoshua. Yeshua takes command of the Jewish people. His job is to enter into the land and to conquer it and to settle there. He sends out two spies in order to get the feel of what exactly the people in the land are feeling at this particular point. He finds out that they have melted before the Jewish people. The fear of, of the God of Israel against them is just overwhelming. He then prepares the Jews for the crossing over of the Jordan. And then we have uh, this miraculous crossing where the waters uh, open up, split, and uh, the Jewish people transfer from the eastern bank to the western bank into Eretz Israel proper. At that particular point, they go to the encampment, the first encampment, which is in Gilgal. They set up camp over there and immediately go to the first order of business, which was commanded upon them, and that is, of course, to do Brit Milah circumcision, which, which has not been done during the 40 years while the Jews traveled into uh, through the, throughout the desert. Once that's completed, they then go on to do Korban Pesach. After that is completed, we are now ready for chapter 6, which uh, tells us about the conquest of Jericho. Just one note over here about the actual act of circumcision, which we brought up last week, and a few people have asked me questions. How is it possible that during those 40 years, the Jews never really fulfilled that important commandment? We brought up a few reasons that there wasn't uh, a, a certain type of wind that came and healed the people, and the people were traveling, so they never, never, they never really knew when they would have to be uprooted and go to an exit place, which would endanger them. Rabbi Kahana writes over here in Or Harayon, It is clear to me that God, despite Mila, circumcision's great importance, intentionally postponed its fulfillment so that Israel would be able to fulfill it upon entering the land of Eretz Yisroel. Mila involves pain and blood, symbolizing the principle of self-sacrifice and faith in God, a lesson which was imparted that Eretz Yisrael is acquired through suffering. Moreover, combining Mila, circumcision, with Eretz Yisroel serves to set the Jews apart and separate. It comes to separate Israel from the nations and their abominations. So here, Rabbi Kana sets the tone over here that it was intentionally put off by God, so to speak, not giving them the circumstances in order to fulfill that commandment, in order to teach us a very important lesson upon entering the land of Eretz Yisrael, that the land of Eretz Yisrael is conquered and settled only through suffering. And that's a point that's true back in the time of Yeshua. It is true also in our day, God tells us in the in the Talmud three things are acquired through suffering. Uh, they are Olam Haba, the world to come, Torah learning, and Eretz Israel. So don't think it's a free ride just to come in. Oh, everything's great and dandy, like some of the tourists and the visitors who come to this land. They go to the big five-star hotels, the other big places that they go. They eat these big meals and stuff, and they think, oh, this is great. What a great land over here. No. When you really hit the nitty-gritty, yeah, there's suffering here, there's pain. That's exactly the point because uh, there's no other way to conquer the land of Eretz Israel except through suffering and pain, which unfortunately the Jewish people have felt on ourselves over the last decades. And here we go to chapter 6 over here. Jericho has shut its gates and was bond before the children of Israel. No one went in, nobody went out, closed and sealed. And here God tells Yoshua, this is the battle plan over here. You shall circle the city, all the men of war, go out around the city once. And this shall take you six days. That means for the next six days you will go around the city each day, you will circle upon it once. The priest shall bear the seven trumpets of the ram's horns before the ark, and then the seventh day you shall en 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 encircle the city seven times. A beautiful blowing plan over here, obviously. And uh, it shall be that when they make a long blast with the ram's horns, and you hear the, uh, you hear the, the sound of the shofar, the people shall shout a great shout, 
and the walls of the city shall fall down in its place. An open miracle, obviously, a continuation of, of an open miracle. Yes, the men of war had to go also. It wasn't something that you could just sit home and watch on TV, but you had to actually participate. But it was obviously a war like no other war, this first war and this first uh, entering into the land of, uh, into the city of Jericho. Interesting enough that it says that it will fall in its place because our rabbis teach us that the wall of the city and its height were the same. I mean, it was so, it was so huge, uh, height-wise and, and wide, that it was almost impossible for anyone to, to, to go in. So, so to speak, the, the, when, the, when this miracle took place, the earth, so to speak, swallowed up the entire wall, just went inside, and the Jewish people, the army, was able just to flunk into the city of Jericho. Oh, yes. So Yeshua, the son of Nun, called the priests, and he said to them, Take up the ark, and the uh, and let seven priests uh, bearing the trumpets and the rams. You could read on here at home with me. I'm on chapter 6. And he said to the people, Pass on and encircle the city. And so they did. And so they did. And besides the men of war who went out there and the priests blowing this, the, the trumpets, we also have the ark over here and also to teach us another important lesson. And that is that this was to, to impress upon the people that it's not just our military might that is enabling us to conquer Jericho and the other cities that follow afterwards, but it is by God's will that we were able to do it. So the ark traveled with them when they circled around the city of Jericho. J Joshua rose up early in the morning. The priests took the ark of the Lord and the seven priests bearing the seven trumpets of the ram's horns before the ark of the Lord were going continuously and they blew the trumpets. The, tense and se the sentence says that it was on the seventh day. So this was done, first of all, every day. And while they were traveling around the cities, they were quiet. They didn't speak any words. This must have you know, freaked out the inhabitants uh, who were watching them, obviously, from inside the wall city, seeing the Jews circle them every day. But on the seventh day, which Rashi tells us was also the Sabbath, they circled around the city seven times. And only then did they blow the chauffeur and this great miracle occurred. The walls came down. We say the walls of Jericho came tumbling down, but as we've said, that's not really the case. They just sort of got buried inside the earth, and the army was able to enter into the city of Jericho. An important point over here to point out is that this conquering of Jericho took place on the Sabbath. And the question is, why did it have to take place on the Sabbath? Obviously, there was killing going on. There was fires that had to be lit, burnt down. The whole city was destroyed. Wouldn't it have been better if this was done on a different day than the Sabbath? Why desecrate the Sabbath when there's no need for it? So instead of, like, we said that we have to circle around the city seven days. Yeah. So start on a different day. So the conquering of the city will fall on a Monday or a Tuesday. Then there's no problem with desecration of the Sabbath. I mean, walking around the city with the ark wouldn't really be a uh, big thing if that's during the week. But why have the battle itself and the conquering of the city of Jericho, Dafkar on Shabbat? The lesson is an important lesson. It comes to teach us that when we come to the battles for Eretz Yisrael, the battles of Milchemet Mitzvah, a commandment of fighting the wars in the land of Eretz Yisrael, you fight even on Shabbat. And I think God himself is teaching us this lesson. Don't think that, oh, you know, it's Shabbos now. Put out the army, let's close down shop, etc. No, because obviously, if our enemies knew that for a second you were closing down shop because it's Shabbos, oh, you can't go out to fight, then obviously that would be their time to attack us. So that was not going to happen. God is teaching us this very important lesson that even on the Shabbos, and Dafkar on the Shabbos, that's the day that you are going out to battle and to conquest the land of Eretz Israel. Because when it comes to the commandment of of, of war, the commandment of fighting for the land of Eretz Israel, defending the land of Eretz Israel, it takes preference over the Shabbos, as we know, obviously. So this was a very important lesson, and I want everyone to mark that in their notebooks. Okay. The text goes on to tell us over here, the city was destroyed all upon it, and then except for Rachav the harlot, she lived with all of our family. This was a special condition which we saw before when the two spies came out and they made this condition because she helped them. 
So now she would be spared and her family would be spared. Now, Yeshua adds over here an extra condition, and that is that being that this is the first city in the land of Eretz Israel that is being attacked and conquered, and it's being done in a miraculous way, a miraculous fashion. So we see from this that Yeshua placed a special ban that in spite of the facts, usually when you go out to battle, you're allowed to take part of the spoils. You're allowed to take part of the, of the, of the flocks and the goats, and you're allowed to bring them home with you. In this case, he made a decree that no one is allowed to take anything. This will be kadosh. This will be a holy in this, uh, in this city. The city will never be rebuilt. He cursed anyone who tried to rebuild this city, and he wanted this as a monument for all times, for everyone to come and to see the Koach of Kadosh Baruch Hu, even many, many years later, people will come and point to this rubble uh, where the city of Jericho once stood and say, oh, look at this. This is how God brought his people into the land of Eretz Israel, miraculously, in this, with this miraculous uh, battle that took place uh, in Jericho. So this was a decree by Joshua that no one would be able to take none of the silver, the gold, the, the garments, everything had to be left, destroyed, and burnt thoroughly throughout the the entire stay over here. And it was that all the gold and silver, the vessels, the copper, the iron, were made holy to God. They shall come into the treasury of the Lord. And the people shouted, and the priests blew the trumpets. And it was when all the people heard the sound of the trumpets that the people shouted with a great shout. And the walls fell in its place. And the people went up to the city, every man opposite him, and took the city. And they completely destroyed all that was in the city, both men and women, young and old, ox and sheep and asses, they killed with the edge of the swords. Everybody went over here. I mean, this was a total wipeout. No prisoners were taken in this battle over here. That's right. Women, children, the cattle, everything was going. In fact, we find the commandment given to the Jewish people in the book of Deuteronomy from the Torah itself. There it tells us that the people who lived in the land of Eretz Israel from the seven nations, lo kol nishama, no soul shall remain. Everyone had to be killed. And in fact, that was fulfilled now with the destruction of Jericho. The only people who stayed alive during this time was Rachav and her family because there was a treaty with her because of her help that she gave to the Jewish people, to the two spies, when they came to check out the city. So it's, a, it's an unbelievable thing if you think about it, that how could you know Jewish soldiers go in? It's obviously a different time and far removed from our days of, 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 of what we call uh, a, a, a war that's for, fought with values and keeping people alive and smart bombs going into certain walls and windows and blowing up just one particular person and keeping everyone else alive and not hurting anybody. This was a whole different type of parsha over here. This is the way it was always meant to be. When the Jews came in, they had the obligation against the seven nations, wipe out everybody, women, children, cattle, everybody had to go across the board. And they burnt the city with fire and all that was in it, only the silver and the gold and the copper vessels and the iron they put into the treasury of the house of the Lord. But Rachav, the prostitute, and her father's household and all that she had, Yoshua saved alive and dwelt and, de- and dwelt in the midst of Israel to this very day. In fact, uh, Chazal tells us that uh, Rachab eventually married Yehoshua, Yehoshua himself. Simen tov, mazel tov, mazel tov, simen tov, yehilanu. Simen tov. So that was a great day. That was a great wedding. So once again, we saw that lesson previously, how someone could be like on the lowest level of the totem pole, someone who's a prostitute, for all these years, and, and, and by doing tshuva, coming back, and eventually marrying Yoshua himself. That was a great a great item right over there. Yeshua, at that time, said, Curse any man before the Lord who raises up and builds the city. Yeshua, with the, loss, with, with the loss of his firstborn, he shall lay the foundations, and with the loss of his younger son, shall he set up the gates. So the Lord was with Yoshua, and his fame throughout the entire land. Once again, Yeshua makes another decree. God obviously agrees with him that the city of, Yoshua, of, of Jericho should be left destroyed in a pile of rubble uh, for all generations to see, to point out the great victory 
of God against his enemies. And that's the way that it was for hundreds of years until the book of uh, time, time of King Ahav. And we will see that later when we get to the book of Kings. This ends chapter 6 over here. The city of Jericho went and destroyed forever. I'm Levi Chazan and you are not. Until next time.